going to continue our series in Romans, um, and we're going to pick up uh, where we left off from last week. We'll end uh, chapter 2 uh, today, and we'll begin chapter 3, hopefully. I don't know if it's next week, or we might be taking a break for the month of July and doing some mixtapes type stuff. Uh, so more to come on that. Um, like I said earlier, my name is Wes. I'm just one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm very grateful that um, I'm back home, back home with you all. Uh, we had a great trip to Guatemala, and I can't wait to tell and share stories from that and, and as a group for us to do so. Um, but it's always good to be home. You know, home is, uh, is, is kind of a beautiful thing. Um, let's open with prayer. And if you haven't been here before when I've, when I've spoken, um, you know what? I, I typically like engagement, so I'll be trying to, to figure that out. So if you feel like, hey, you know, amening, Youping, whooping, hollering, whatever, I'm, that does not bother me. I'd love it. Um, I'll ask questions. Please engage. Uh, I just feel like it goes better. I mean, the more engaged we are, the more interactive we are. I, what I tend to think is we tend to take more home with us. And this isn't, um, you know, we don't teach on Sundays so that we have a platform to speak. We teach so that we can be more prepared to go out on Monday through Saturday. Um, so, you know, whatever you need to get that, then I think you should feel freedom in that. Um, I don't even mind the occasional question, unless it's weird stuff, and then I'll just ignore it. And don't feel like I'm being rude, it's just, it was a dumb question, and I had to ignore it. <laughs> All right? I'm just going to be honest. Um, <laughs> and if it's something like that, we can handle it after the service. But, uh, but for real, it, it, it will not bother me. Uh, I, I mean, I love that stuff, so feel free to do that. Pray that um, for you, God will move, uh, and for me as well, that he will speak into our hearts, into our lives, that we'll be transformed by his word. I believe the word really does have power. It doesn't return void. I believe that because it tells us this, and I believe that when we encounter God, uh, we always leave changed. So today, the prayer is that we would encounter God, that we would leave changed, and for me, that you would just pray that I would use wisdom and discernment and know what to say, and uh, let's hit the ground running, all right? Uh, Our Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Um, God, we should be in awe of you with every moment of our lives. You speak and stars spew out and exist. Out of nothing, you create the universe. And you know every single one of us by name. You know the hurts in our heart. You know the struggles that we face. And Father, you even know the failures that we carry. And yet, you love us. And Father, you are perfectly holy. You are different than anything we could ever dream. And you love us. So, Father, let that sit heavily on our hearts today. Let it call us into a place of worship for you and love for you. And, God, give us wisdom with every single step. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when I played um, baseball in um, high school and in college and then after college, I went on to play, you know, softball, like the natural transition, right? Um, but I always had these little ticks. okay? So, um, before I'd go onto the field, I never touch the foul line. I jump over it. And depending on the position I'm going to play, so a lot of times I was always middle infield, like shortstop, sometimes third, stuff like that. But I would either that or I'd pitch. So when I'd pitch, I'd make sure I wouldn't hit the line and then basically kind of just get into the right headspace to pitch because it's not really just an athletic game, it's a mental game. Um, but then when I would go to shortstop, I always had the, the oddity of I would lick my glove. Anybody? Like, that's not gross, right? It's dirty. It's all these things. I still do it as a side note, even when I coach, because I'd go out and pitch to 8U, and I'm like, listen, I, I mean, I've still got to get in the game, you know? So I'd lick my glove, and then, you know, if, uh, if a bad play happened or something, then, you know, I'd have to reboot and restart it and do it all over again. Now, the thing is, in baseball, a lot of times players are extremely superstitious. Like, me telling you the story, it is not that weird, even though you're like, this guy, I can't trust him with anything. Definitely not eating my food at a potluck, right? Um, so here's the deal. Um, superstition happens throughout baseball, but it happens throughout our lives where we start to put a, a focus on some of these little nuances that we do, and we say that's, a, that's what's going to get it done. The reality is I was a good baseball player because I had talent. I also put in a lot of work before the game ever started. Like, it wasn't because I licked my glove on the way to shortstop. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't catch the ground ball because I licked the glove. I didn't make a good throw because... You know, I didn't touch the line, or I didn't throw a really good curveball because, you know, I ate a bucket of chicken before the game started, right? 
really that's actually something some of the major league players do, especially if you're really a, a baseball historian. Um, the, the reason people succeed isn't because of these practices, but it's because of something that happened beforehand. Does that make sense? Like, it wasn't in the line jump. It was in, yeah, but I would, you know, practice ground balls all the time, on my own even, just to make sure I get my form right, my fundamentals right, my footwork it was right. Um, but still, every single game, guess what I would do? Jump the line, lick my glove. All right, it's just the way it is. Um, I'd also use a gallon of sunscreen, but that was just mostly like survival, okay? Had nothing to do with success on the ball field. Anyways, the reason I tell you that is if I had a title for today's sermon, it would be Ritual versus or Ritual Without Regeneration. We're just as apt to do the similar kind of things in the church today and say that's, that's the actual reason I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because I grew up in church. It's the only thing I've ever known. My grandma was a Christian. I went to Bible school. I went to Sunday school. Um, I'm a Christian because I give regularly or because I, uh, I'm a part of a small group or because I'm a pastor. And none of those are the reasons that I'm a Christian. But that's what we lean in on, right? Just like I lean in on, if I touch this line, I have to actually go back off the field, get in the dugout, take my glove back off, now put it back on, then go over and jump over the line. Now I'm a good baseball player. You see, your faith um, really has less to do with a lot of really good things and really only to do with one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only way for us to find salvation. But we tend to lean in on ritual, and we forget that Jesus is more interested in our hearts. All right, and that's where we get to in Romans. And Romans 2, the last four or five verses, Romans 2, 25 through 29, let's turn to it. And I think we'll dive in, and I think we'll see something really big for us, even though what we see is Paul writing to this very specific church and people, but the message still carries over for us today. So in verse 25, it says, Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So <clears throat> if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. So we need to start with a few things, just an understanding of uh, the circumcision practice. When God provided Abraham with an outward sign of a very personal, intimate relationship with his creator, he then said to Abraham, you shall be circumcised. So we've got to ask the question, what's the symbolism of a circumcision? Um, it was essentially a visual sign of the penalty for breaking the covenant. And covenant's not a word that we really get very accustomed to in 2024. We just don't use it a lot. We do stuff like um, a contract, right? Contract's a much more common word than you went to the bank and you signed a loan covenant, right? It doesn't say that on the documentation. You don't go into, you know, if you're an NBA player and sign your salary contract, it doesn't say here's your salary covenant. It's a contract. But contract's are really a kind of a closer word for us to kind of get to understand covenant, except covenant's a little bit bigger. So in ancient times, the way that you would actually bind a deal, it wouldn't be that, Jess, you would bring a piece of paper and, you know, I would sign it, you would sign it, and we'd have a, someone to come in with that little stamp and stamp it, right? Like that wouldn't happen. Instead, to bind a deal, there was an act that would be taken. So you would see some things. Uh, you would act out essentially a curse that if you accept a covenant and you break it, this will actually happen to you. So um, a really good example is actually one in which God did in establishing this covenant with Abraham. Uh, in this vision Abraham had with God, there was an animal that was split in half, and then symbolically um, God walked through in between these two halves. And what that really meant was this, was that on God's word against himself, essentially, if I, God, and I'm not saying I'm God, right, but I, God, break this covenant with you, 
may what happened to this animal essentially happen to me. God is saying on everything that I am, you could rip me in half if I break my word to you. All right? The same thing would happen for us, like, in times when someone would break a covenant, you know, it, they might have something where, it, you know, it sends them into bondage for that person, or they would put dust on their head saying, may I be dead and put back into the earth if I break this covenant. It was a really, really big deal. Does that paint a big picture of the word covenant? It's bigger than a, a bank loan, right? Because a bank loan, you break it, they just come and get your car. They take it back. In this case, it's no, everything will be ripped apart. This is how serious God is about the word covenant, which is really good for us and um, really weird for him in some ways because we're not great covenant keepers. Um, so we break covenants often, um, and we'll hear more about that. But God is a perfect covenant keeper, right? So that's where when we say if God promised it, then we can go ahead and account it as good as being done, even if it's not done for another thousand. Like, like Jesus promised to return, and yet he's not back today. Does that mean he's not coming back? No, we know he's coming back because he simply just because he said it. That's enough. He didn't have to do anything else. He said, I'm coming back. Okay. That's as good as it being done and him being here today. We're just basically waiting on the porch for him to show up. Make sense? All right, good. Now let's move on. The Jews believed, here's the issue that got them into trouble. The Jews believed that circumcision is actually what protects them from God's judgment since, you know, this was a part of that covenant. They thought it would actually guarantee them entrance into heaven by being just a Jew, right? Uh, Jewish in practice. So if I am circumcised, if I am this, and even Paul later on writes, like, if, I, if anyone has any room to boast, I mean, I am like Jew of Jews, right? Like, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. I am a, like, everything you can say a Jew should do, I've done. Right, but then he goes on to say, but I count it all as a loss, and we'll see that here in just a little bit. You see, they thought this was a guaranteed entrance into the kingdom of God, but Paul actually disagreed. He actually was saying in this section that a physical act is not a guarantee of spiritual salvation. He says that an outward sign, even one that's given to us by God, an outward sign like circumcision was a gift from God saying, hey, this is a sign of our covenant. All right, so this is a God-ordained action. And yet Paul is saying, even this is worthless if it's not connected, if it's not connected with an inward work of grace in the heart. Well, you have to understand that for the people reading this and hearing this for the first time that were Jews, this is completely blowing their world out of the water. Like, their worldview in this moment is being just completely flipped upside down. Because so much of their practice, I mean, even if you get into like really studying the Old Testament, even up to Jesus' time, he was so hard on the Pharisees because they had some of these ridiculous rules that if they kept them, they were good, right? Like you can only walk so many steps at a certain, <laughs> certain day on the Sabbath, like if you go past that. But then you could cheat if you had, you know, own property somewhere in the middle between, and then you restart. Like you can see all of this, and this is what legalism always leads us to. I can justify anything if I can just figure out the loophole, right? Which is also then saying, if you're trying to find the loophole and how you can get away with whatever with God, your heart really probably may not know who God is because there really are no loopholes, right? I mean, even in this, he says, if you're going to at least keep with the circumcision, then you have to do it perfectly because if you break one thing, you might as well not even be circumcised, right? Loopholes don't count, in other words. So God doesn't prescribe salvation by surgery, salvation by circumcision. This is not the whole thing. Like when he's given this to Abraham, Abraham was considered righteous because of his faith, not because of his circumcision. We know that in Hebrews. But we also know that God began, to begin, uh, began this relationship with Abraham before he had anything nipped. Right? I mean, he was beginning to walk with Abram before he was Abraham, before he was circumcised. In fact, he called Abraham, or he called Abram from nowhere, right? So Paul, he states that this outward sign is it requires this inward work of grace. And really the only way that we can be delivered by, uh, from his judgment is by putting our trust in the finished work of Christ. And, and the reason that, that this works is because he is the one who died as a sacrifice for our sins. 
And we'll get into this a little bit, but when you talk about a cutting off, this is what circumcision represented, right? It was a cutting off from this previous life, entering into this new covenant. Well, Jesus came to be cut off from the Father so that we could be restored. This is actually a real circumcision. He was cut off from this life. Remember the part on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off from his father so that you and I don't have to be cut off any longer. And here's the thing. We, we see this, that Jesus is the finished, and the finished work of Christ is the way for us to have salvation. And it's by this, in this, that we are the ones that will find that the true Jew or the true Israelite isn't just someone from a national citizenship, but from a heavenly citizenship. It actually centers on Jesus. And this is actually who Abraham sees. This is why he's the father of many nations, not just the father of a nation. It's not just a people group, but a bigger like, understanding. It starts to expand through Jesus. We are all able to be heirs and descendants of Abraham. It doesn't make you Jewish today. Okay, as a side note, that is an ethnicity. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but if you didn't, you've left with one fact for the whole day, that Jewish is also an ethnicity, but in our side, uh, we can be a true Jew because of Christ. Now, here's how we do this today, right? We rely on different outward signs to plead our cases. We may not be sitting here in our chairs thinking, well, I'm circumcised, so that makes me a Christian and I'm going to heaven, right? I'm sure none of us woke up this morning resting our hats on that, right? Okay. But we do tend to do it in other ways, okay? I grew up in church, for example. I grew up, I went to Sunday school every Sunday morning. I went to youth group on Wednesday nights. I went to Bible schools. Um, I even studied the Bible. Uh, my grandma maybe went to church, and she made me go every time that she would go. And uh, I vote Republican or I vote Democrat. You know, that's a sure sign that I'm a Christian. Um, I'm a pastor. An elder. Um, I pray to prayer. Like we, we cling to a lot of physical things. I give you know, once a year. That's my thing. I come on Easter and Christmas, and that's the whole Christian obligation anyways, right? Um, no, it's not. You just haven't read the Bible enough to know that he says not to forsake the gathering. You should be here regularly because this is where we prepare to go out, and twice a year ain't going to cut it. If you work out twice a year, I'm going on a different rant real quick. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> But if you, if you work out twice a year, you are not in shape, all right? Um, I, I'll just tell you, you, listen, I don't run, all right? And I don't claim to run. So if someone were to say, hey, you look like you could probably, you're, you're ready to run a 5K. No, I'd die, okay? I know what would happen, all right? Because I don't do this. I should do this. I don't do it. If I want to have better you know, conditioning for that, then I know what I need to do. Guess what? I need to run. Well, if you really want to see what it looks like to live in a faithful, growing relationship with the God of the universe, then we need to obey and, and actually be a part of community, which he calls us to. And twice a year, listen, if you hang out with me twice a year, don't, don't worry about telling people we're friends. We're acquaintances. All right? And if you think that's, you know, anyways, different sermon. All right, I'll stop. It gets me fired up. I had a guy one time tell me he was going to church here, and I was like, bro, I ain't seen you in 18 months. Well, that's the last time I was there. You don't go to church here. Thank you, though, for your loyalty, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, anyways, we use these excuses, all right? Has anyone ever said the reason that you know you're a Christian is because, well, I'm a part of Ridge Church? Well, I mean, I grew up, you know, I went to Newcomb Baptist Church. That's where I grew up as a kid. Um, I had a, a really neat story. My, one of my best friends, probably my best friend, Gordy, uh, I might have told this story before, but his wife, they were on their first date. They were not married yet. That would have been weird. Um, they went on a first date, and he asked her what she, uh, she asked him, uh, he asked her what she was. And she's like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I'm a church of Christ. And she said, oh, well, I'm a Christian. And he was like, well, I mean, yeah, but you know what I mean. She goes, no, my identity is not because of the things that I practice. My identity is in the person of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. Changed everything about him that day. Now he gives me a hard time if I mistake, you know, I misspeak anything. I'm like, yeah, man, how's your church? It's not my church, bro. I'm like, oh, freaking A. 
I'm like, you've got to go here. You know what I mean. But anyways, we do this, don't we? We put our you know, eggs in the basket of religious practices, and yet we neglect the reality that even though these are good things, they are not these things. You see, we can replace some of these other things. It's possible for us to actually rely on stuff like our church membership and being a part of a visible body of believers for salvation instead of the person of Christ. We can replace words like circumcision with other words. I know I'm a Christian because blank. Or if I go into Romans and really literally do this, baptism benefits me because. Tithing benefits me because. Church attendance benefits me because. Volunteering in Ridge Kids benefits me because. And yet I can be really far from Christ. I have no doubt that there will be many people that are labeled as pastors today that when we get to heaven and give a reckoning before God that Jesus will look at some of us and say depart from me I never knew you because we put practice over the person and if that doesn't shake us a bit to the core it should it should hit every single one of us me included Because so much of how we try to validate our spiritual condition is based on spiritual disciplines and not a relationship. And these are good things. Like it's good to pray. Right? Amen? It's good to do worship music and worship God through studying his word in church. It's good to help someone that's hungry. It's good. All of these things are good, but your works are not what buy your salvation, only the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. A relationship with him is the only way. Now, here's where it gets difficult for us because if we have a relationship with Christ, all of these things that we are saying are good should overflow into our lives. All right, so I'm not saying don't give, don't show up to church, don't do tithing, don't help the, no. If you are in a relationship with Jesus, I shouldn't even have to compel you to do those things. But your love for him should compel you to do those things. Like the reason I go to Guatemala isn't because I'm really good in the sunlight. <laughs> right? Like that's, no. I go there because my brother is pastoring a church there and God has called us to be there for a brother. So we go. You see, it's only meaningful if your heart's been truly transformed. Being a Christian is not an external label. You see, true Christianity is not about having confidence in outward things. What counts is the inward change, a heartfelt belonging to God's people. And this is a supernatural work, not human. You see, it's possible to trust in Christianity rather than in Christ. Have you ever thought about that? To trust in Christianity over Christ. Christianity isn't Christianity because we gather together. Christianity is Christianity because of Christ. But it, we, we can put so much of our identity and our faith in the label that we call ourselves that we miss the point of it altogether. We're not here to sing songs and to go through a Bible study just because it's what you do on a Sunday morning and if you're going to call yourself a Christian, it's just what we do. We do it because God is worthy. We do it because we love him. We do it because I want more of this. Like in this is the words of life. This is the book of life. In this, my life is actually going to be blessed because God gave this to us. It's a revelation of himself to us. This is not even a book about me. It's a book about him. We don't sing songs because I have a great voice. I don't. We sing songs because he's worthy of praise. Regardless if you can hit a sharp, a minor, I don't even know if these are the right labels. Is it? Whatever they are. Like, that's not the reason we do it. We don't even do it to make a good sound, but a joyful noise. It is possible to trust in Christianity rather than Christ. And this can happen in a conservative evangelical church. It can. We can be so focused on being the church that we miss the whole point. 
that we missed the point that God has actually called us to something bigger than just being a clubhouse for conservatives, liberals, or Democrats, or whatever. It doesn't matter if it's an election year. We're not here for politics. We're here for purpose, him. And in fact, Paul is actually showing us something in here, and what I'll call it is dead orthodoxy. He's calling something dead orthodox. It's where the fundamental doctrines of the Bible are accurately subscribed to, but they actually don't make an internal difference. It's like saying, well, I'm going to pray before my meal, but I'm actually not thinking about it's actually God that provides it. Because I went to Kroger and got it. I'm just glad that I had the power to cook. Well, you paid the light bill, right? Like, like we may say thank you without ever being grateful. In fact, uh, just a neat little thing I heard this week, and it was really eye-opening. Um, Pastor uh, Louis Giglio was talking about it. He said, you know, using the Lord's name in vain is not saying GD. Like, we get it in the physical act of a word that comes out of our mouths, but really taking the Lord's name in vain is actually starting to underappreciate actually who God is and not recognizing that his name is worthy of worship. It isn't the word that comes out of your mouth. It's that, like the most critical way for us to take God's name in vain in vain is to reject him as our savior right because everything he's done we can look at it and we can say I just don't trust it I don't believe your name is what it is that's way more in vain than something that comes out of your mouth that'll change your worldview and what it means to take the Lord's name in vain or to pray you see practices are way less important like when, when we they are good and they are great but the most important piece of this is about Jesus Christ and our relationship with him this form of Christianity we're talking about for dead orthodoxy is outside out. It actually never penetrates the heart rather than the true gospel faith, which is inside out. And Jesus actually had a picture of this for us in Matthew. If you'll flip to it real quick, if not, it'll be on the screen. In chapter 23, Jesus actually said something, and guess who he said it to? He said it to really religious people. I would, say, I would even dare to say that this would probably be church people like us today. And he said this to them in verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may become clean. You see, when the church becomes a religious cushion, people gather for reassurance that they are all right. We used to have a saying that we'd say here pretty often, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. We have now come to the point in the American church that it's okay to not be okay. As long as we agree and share similar points of view, you're going to be happy here. And that is not necessarily what God has called us to. Now, it is okay to not be okay. You are always welcome here, but it's also not okay to stay there. God is calling you to a place of hope in your hopelessness, a place of wholeness in your brokenness, a place of life out of death. Like, that's the promises of God, and it's all founded in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, that's what he's called us to. When a church practices this dead orthodoxy, here are three types of churches, and I think we actually, as Ridge Church, I think we line up with these first two, uh, at least at, from time to time, if not on a consistent basis, just to be honest. We should be able to be honest in here, so I'm just going to call it out. But a legalistic church... Uh, is one, and it produces detailed codes of conduct and details of doctrine. Members need to continually need continually to hear that they are more holy and accurate, and that the liberals are wrong. They functionally rely on their theological correctness. Sound doctrine equals righteousness. And while it is really good to practice um, honoring God's word and doctrine and theology and all of this stuff, we don't honor those and then reject Jesus and forget that He's actually the center of it all. He has called us to worship him, not our theology or our doctrine. And again, these are actually good things whenever we operate within them rightly. But if we cast out who Jesus is as our, the author of our salvation and we just become really legalistic people, isn't that really what the Pharisees were doing in their day? Well, hey, you didn't wash your hands the right way. Hey, no, you actually did this. No, hey, you can't pull your donkey out of the pit. Hey, hey, no, you can't do... Instead, Jesus was on them as harshly as anyone. I think this is another one because I think this is, and I'll tell you why I think these two are us. It's not a shot at us as a church. This is just humanity. Power churches are another one. They put a great emphasis on miracles and spectacular works of God. Members need to continually 
uh, to have powerful or emotional experiences and see dramatic occurrences. They rely on their feelings and dramatic answers to prayer. Great emotion equals righteousness. And here's the thing. The reason I say I think we identify with these two because they just make sense. One is almost like a head understanding, right? If you think about it from a legalistic, well, I mean, we work in a world where if you do your job, you get paid for it. You show up to school, you put in the studies, you get good grades, you graduate, right? We are really kind of wired. It's ingrained in us that as we check the boxes, there is a good result that comes. So it's really natural for us to cling to a more legalistic side. It's just natural. But then we also like to feel things. We're emotional beings, yes or no, right? We're emotional. So a lot of times we say, God is in this place because I can what? I can feel him. So are you saying in the moments you don't feel God that he has lost his ability to be omnipresent? No, because whether you feel him or not, guess who's here? God. There's a prayer I pray every Sunday before I get ready to speak. I'm like, God, are you with me? And, and I go back to a Dallas Willard thing, and he said, he used to do the same thing to himself, and he said, he would always feel reassured. He'd say, God, are you with me? And God would remind him in his heart, from your head down to your socks. And, you know, we need that moment where it's like that assurance or that reassurance that God is with us. But the reality is God never leaves you or forsakes you. You don't need an emotional experience to know that God is with you. Like God is with you if you are a child of his. He abides in your heart regardless if you feel it in the moment. If you got the little goose, you know, bumps on your skin or not, guess what? It doesn't matter. God here, still the same. These are the two most natural for us to slide into because one is all about head understanding, the other is heart understanding, and we lean into them. And I'm not even saying that it's necessarily wrong, but if you're believing that's what indicates you're doing things that, you know, hey, this is honoring of God, listen, the fundamental truth is still the same. We honor God first by having a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. That is how we begin our process and our path and our journey to honoring God and living for his glory. It all starts at the cross being faithful to theology and doctrine and even feeling emotion are good ways to honor God too. But they do not overstep their placement in what is the priority, and that is Jesus and Jesus alone. Okay? All right, the next one is, uh, I'll be honest, I had to Google how to say this one, sacerdotal, I know, uh, churches, and basically this is rituals and tradition, the beauty of music and architecture, and liturgy, and grandeur, and all of this, and really these ceremonies are here to anesthetize uh, guilt-ridden people. We follow liturgy, and that means righteousness. Like, we sing this song, the doxology at the end. This is a liturgical song. Listen, it does not mean that you mean it. Does that make sense? You can sing the words and never actually mean it from your heart, okay? So praise God from whom all blessings flow. Do you mean that? You know that every blessing flows from God? Are you really saying, God, thank you for moving in my life, for blessing me in such an abundant way? Or are we singing some songs way too slowly? You know what I'm saying? All right, good. Move on. The passage emphasizes the significance of a circumcised heart and symbolizing a spiritual softening and intimacy with God. It actually highlights the importance of active prayer life rooted in love and contrast it with a sense of deadness and insecurity experienced by those who lack a genuine connection with God. You see, we can lean into being the church without ever leaning into Christ. And the thing is, we should lean into Christ, and that should cause us to be leaning in as the church. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, he is still the ultimate focus of our hearts. You see, it is a... Uh, circumcision is a profoundly personal and intimate procedure. We're not going to get into the details of what it is if you don't know... I mean, Google it. Don't go image search. Um, God was telling Abraham that he wanted him to be in a relationship with him. He needed him to be circumcised as a sign of the commitment. But this circumcision for Abraham was actually something that symbolized that if he broke the covenant, remember we talked about this, there would be a complete separation from others, from life, and from God. But here's the problem we have today because we're looking back at this and we start to see all these things. No one keeps the covenant. Abraham failed. Uh, I mean, God said, you're going to be a father of many nations. It's going to happen with your wife, Sarai. And who does he have his firstborn with? Hagar. Because he was convinced by his wife who didn't believe that God was going to provide through her. So he, she said, hey, here's my handmaiden. And Abraham, being a foolish husband, 
said, sure. And if you don't know why, you, you haven't been married long enough, you'll figure that out why. That's foolish. No one keeps the covenant. So I, I think it actually means for us, we have to ask some questions. How can God have any people at all if no one can keep a covenant that he's made with them? And then two, how can anyone be right with him? And I think we actually get that answer in Colossians chapter 2. So if you'll turn there real fast, and we're going to start landing the plane here in just a second. In Colossians 2, verse 11, listen to this. Here's how this starts to level out. You are also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. So how does our circumcision become something that actually is more than just good, but it is actually transformative? What, how does circumcision put us into a covenant with God? Well, our circumcision that brings us into that covenant with God is actually a circumcision in him. The him he's talking about is in Jesus, right? And then in 2.11, it just ends it, and it's so, so great how it ends it. The circumcision of Christ. We already talked about it a little bit. Jesus was cut off from the Father. He was cut off from life itself. And he was also resurrected. He took life back up. And then he ascended where? To who? The Father, right? All right, so Jesus was cut off and ultimately restored and elevated, right? It's in his circumcision, the circumcision of his cut offness that now we no longer actually have to be bound to being cut off. Our imperfect keeping of the covenant is covered by his perfect keeping of the covenant. God not only acted in the, in the behalf of Abram by walking in between this split animal, right, to establish a covenant of what it means to be his people. God's saying, if I break my end of the covenant, then this will happen to me. But then his son comes up as the representative on our behalf and says, I'm going to be cut off so that my people will never be cut off. And Father, you are keeping this covenant perfectly, and I am reestablishing one that is going to be settled in my flesh, in my life, and I am faithful to you. And now we are perfectly bookended between the covenant keepers of Jesus and the Father. Somewhere in the middle, in our imperfectness, the righteousness of Jesus and the holiness of God has us completely covered, and our sins are no longer remembered because of that covenant. You see why it's not about religious practice? It's about the person. It's not about what you did yesterday, and it's not about the failure you're going to have tomorrow. It's about the faithfulness of God, and do you treasure him? Do you lean into his faithfulness over your perfection? You see, when the Spirit works in someone, he gives them the Son's circumcision, not through religious performance or even the lack of religious performance. None of those even matter. It is through the Spirit applying the work of the Son to us that the Father actually sees you. How did verse, uh, how did verse uh, 29 end? I don't have it open right now, but I'll just tell you how it ends. That person's praise is not from people but from God. Listen to this. Listen to this. Through the Spirit applying the work of the Son to us, the Father actually doesn't see us as people that are condemned, but he sees us as objects worthy of praise. Like he actually looks at you and he says, you're a praiseworthy, not condemned. And the reason you're praiseworthy is because of the faithfulness of the Son. He actually sees us as something way more valuable than we might ever see in our lives. You see, Paul doesn't leave us here holding the bags either. Like we're talking about what does this mean? So, okay, am I not supposed to do good things? No, you should treasure Christ. And out of your treasuring for Christ, it should cause you to live out all of these things that we've talked about. Ritual does not overcome the lack of relationship. But relationship will lead to a life that is poured out for God's glory. And that will be faithful to what he's called us to be. But Paul gives us some examples of actually what that looks like. So this is where we're going to get into Philippians and Galatians. And I'm just going to go quickly, and then we'll start to wrap up with the last section. Philippians 3, verses 3 through 9. Please turn to it, uh, and if not, it'll be on the screen as well. And who knows where mine is? It's in here somewhere. It's the same Bible. uh uh, uh. All right, are we ready? Philippians 3, 3 through 9. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. 
Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, this is Paul writing, if anyone else thinks he has a grounds for confidence in the flesh, listen to this, I have more. I've been circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Basically, Paul is saying, whatever you think you've got, I've got better. I did it all, all in the name of my religion. I went to church every Sunday. I was in a ministry team. I led worship. I'd even teach some. I mean, Paul's even going on to say, like, when something came counter to my faith, I was willing to kill people over it, and he did. He hunted down Christians because of his zeal for his faith. And we kind of do that, too. We just might not say it under the same name. We slaughter people with our words all the time. Well, if they just knew. So we should relate here. But Paul is counting all these things where he's like, hey, listen, I've checked every single box. And listen in verse 7, that everything that was a gain to me, I've considered a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of just knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider, him, uh, consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. And he goes on to say then in Galatians chapter 6, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Christ Jesus. The world has been crucified to me and through, cro through the cross and I to the world for both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. May peace come to all those who follow this standard and, may, and mercy even to the Israel of God. Here's the deal. What matters instead is a new creation. I'm not saying that coming to church, studying your Bible, leading a small group, serving at a soup kitchen, I mean, like any of these things, I'm not saying any of these things are bad things. In fact, these are all really good things. And I'm glad that you're, you're even in. And, and listen, even if you're not a Christian and you're like, listen, but I'm going to be engaged. You know what? Keep doing it. Those are all really good things. What I'm saying is don't trust those things for your salvation. You know, I used in recovery, in the recovery world, when someone would come and they're looking for hope, one of the ways that we would end, we would say, hey, listen, if you aren't there yet, just keep coming back. There's something powerful in just coming back. So I don't want to, like, I'm not taking away from all these things. Like, keep coming back. Keep being a part. Keep doing the good. Keep doing these things. But what I'm saying is this. I'm urging you to ask yourself, has there been true heart change? Has your life been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Not are you active in our church. I want every single person to be active in our church. But more than that, I want every single person to know Christ and to have a life transformed by this Jesus that, that my life is no longer the same because of Jesus has transformed everything for me. I have hope because of him. Like, has your life been transformed by this Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? It's not, are you active in church? No. Are you actively pursuing Christ? Are you looking for him every single day? Are you seeking? Are you loving him? Are you looking at him as the ultimate treasure? Like, do you see Jesus as worthy of every aspect of worship? Is he your life's pursuit? All of these other things may be good, but there is only one thing that is great. And we can't let good rob us of great. We so often do. We let the good replace our potential for greatness. And the potential for greatness is fully rooted in who Jesus is. Because of him, I live. And I can face tomorrow. Because of my love for him, I pastor. I don't pastor because I have something to say. I pastor because I have someone to talk about. Have you had life change? So our worship team is going to come forward, and I'm going to lead us in prayer. 
And here's what I would say for the church. Guard yourself from trusting anything but Christ alone for salvation. Not your baptism, not your membership, not your attendance, nothing. Trust in Christ and Christ alone. And for someone in here that maybe you're not a Christian today, then this would be simply what I would say. Rest by faith on nothing other than Jesus' shed blood and righteousness. It is the only ground for your acceptance for God. Not your good works, not your family relationships, not whether or not you've been baptized. Like the reality is, is if you don't know Jesus, then you are not a Christian. And yet God has made it very real today for you, I hope. That you're here and you're like, man, you mean Jesus loves me? Yeah, he does. He loves you so much that he actually came and died a sinner's death so that you and I could have life. Not so that we could rest our faith on religious practices, but on the person of who he is, the son of God, the living God. He sent his son to be the sacrifice on our behalf. So I would just simply say, if that's you today, place your faith in Jesus. If you don't know what that looks like, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to just pray with you. I'd love to just listen to your story and and just see how God has brought you here today. Make no mistake, you are here today with purpose, regardless if this is your first time or you've been here for years. God brought you here to hear a message, and I hope you've heard his voice, and he's called you into something deeper than just religious discipline. As good or as great as they may be, they do not replace our Savior, Jesus. Jesus is worthy of total adoration and surrender so we're going to open up we're going to have communion this is where we come and we we remember that jesus died for us for our sin and we place our hearts in his care we just trust him with it so we say god i remember that you've given me life and i let go of what i'm clinging to but i want to be with you and this is just a chance for us to just symbolically do that to be honest this is just juice and crackers doing this doesn't save you Only Jesus can save us. The altar is open. Like, please come, pray. If you think you've put more faith in the church than in the Jesus that, that owns it, come forward, repent, and let's cling to Christ. If you're like, man, I've put my faith in all these things I've always done, but really Jesus is what I want to treasure, then come. If you're like, hey, I don't know Jesus, but I want to, then come. Please come today. Make a public step so that this will be something that when we leave, you won't be tempted to let go of by stepping forward then maybe we look at it and say i made an active decision not a passive one let's pray god i love you god give us courage to come forward and to pray courage to come forward and to seek you courage to just throw ourselves at your feet for your mercy and goodness are sufficient your grace is enough father we all have baggage every single one of us have stories that that, God, that include rooms we'd not open to our best friend. But you are already there. And you know every single one of the skeletons in our closets. And yet you look at us with absolute love, mercy, and grace. You see us and you say, come home, sinner. You're my child. Today, give us the courage to faithfully step out of our comfort, to seek your face and to cry out for salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.